the purpose of this video is to go through a somewhat mathematical derivation of the sampling theorem uh, to help illustrate what goes on in the process of doing this. We will use several properties of Fourier transforms, so this is also a useful exercise in terms of describing how Fourier transforms work. So again, the question that we're asking in deriving the sampling theorem is how many samples per second do we need? So how many of uh, these guys over here per second do we need in order to be able to accurately reconstruct the sampled waveform? In order to answer this question, we need to look mathematically at what it means to sample a waveform. And then in the, uh, in the uh, frequency domain, uh, we'll look at what those mathematical uh, implications or what those mathematics imply. And then in the, uh, we'll go back to the time domain at the end to explain what has just happened. Okay, I apologize if the last little bit there was a bit disjointed. Uh, one of the other faculty members just got a Fender amp for his guitar and he's really excited. Okay, so um, the first step then is to look at sampling from a mathematical perspective. So we will um, draw ourselves a signal to sample, which will be x of t. And the idea is that I want to get the value of x at a specific point in time. Now, in real sampling applications, it's very difficult to do this. What you typically see happen is you get, say, an average value of x. You average the signal over some amount of time. And then the next sample represents, again, some averaging over time and so on. And uh, mathematically, you can think of doing this as taking x and multiplying it by a waveform that I'm going to call p of t that looks like this. It's a sequence of rectangles. And each of these rectangles has an area of 1. So um, if it is, uh, if the rectangle, uh, say, is uh, uh, alpha units wide, then it's uh, 1 over alpha units tall. Okay. And then if I take this p and multiply x by it, I get essentially what I've drawn in green on this graph of x. I get rectangles whose height is proportional to the value of x at that time. And uh, so conceptually, hopefully that makes sense. Conceptually, what I want to do is make alpha go to 0. And if I do this, then I get in the limit a delta function. Okay. So I end up with a rectangle that is infinitely narrow and infinitely tall. And when I multiply x by this sort of thing, I get a delta function at each point where I've sampled. And the magnitude of that delta function is given by, sample, by the sampled x. So um, what we will do then is we will draw, we will actually define p of t to be the sequence of delta functions. And so I have a delta function. This, the distance between the delta functions is t sub s. That's a sampling period. So I'll write this as t minus k t sub s, where when k is 0, I have uh, this delta function, the one at 0. When k is 1, I have the delta function at t sub s. k is 2, delta function at t sub, or 2 t sub s. Uh, 
k is equal to minus 1, I have the delta function out here, and so on. So in order to describe this, I take the sum of all these delta functions from k going from minus infinity to infinity. And this gives me, again, a sequence of delta functions that are um, separated by t sub s. Uh, quite often, you see this described as an impulse train. Now, um, again, when I take x and multiply it by p, I get samples, and uh, the resulting signal I will call x sub s for a sampled version of x. And this is equal to x multiplied by this p. And because um, p is this train of impulse responses that looks like this, I can write this as x times the summation from k going from minus infinity to infinity of delta t minus k t sub s. So I've just plugged in the definition here. And then using the fact that each of these delta functions is 0 everywhere except at k t sub s, I can write this as a summation, k again going from minus infinity to infinity, of x evaluated at k t sub s times delta of t minus k t sub s. And again, the reason I can do this is because a given delta function is 0 everywhere except at k t sub s. And so when I multiply it by x, the product is 0 everywhere except at k t sub s. OK. So the goal here is to hopefully reinforce the idea that by multiplying x by p, I now have samples at evenly spaced values, or evenly spaced intervals, of, this, of the signal x. To see what happens next, we will have to go to the frequency domain. And so um, we will actually keep this equation uh, using the fact that multiplication in the time domain is convolution in the frequency domain. That's one of the properties of the Fourier transform. We will get some interesting results. But the first, so the first thing we need to do then is figure out what uh, the Fourier transform of p is. We'll assume that we know what the Fourier transform of x is. At least we'll assume eventually that we know some things about it. So we will erase this for a bit and then um, try to figure out what p of omega is. And this is actually uh, fairly interesting. It turns out that p of t is a periodic function, right? It repeats itself every t sub s seconds. Because it's periodic, it has a Fourier series expansion. And that Fourier series expansion um, or, or in that Fourier series expansion, the uh, fundamental frequency, uh, omega 0, is 1 over, or I'm sorry, 2 pi over t sub s. And each of the Fourier series coefficients is equal to 1 over t sub s. And you get that, I won't actually do this, but you get that by plugging uh, uh, this expression, actually one delta function of this expression, because you're integrating over one period, into the integral expression uh, for the Fourier series. And um, then you integrate over one, one uh, period. And because you're integrating a delta function, it turns out that the area of that delta function is 1. So the 1 over t sub s is the uh, 1 over the period that's in front of the integral. And uh, the 1 up here is just the area of the delta function. If you have questions about why that should work, uh, you might look at the Fourier series video and see if that makes, makes sense. OK. So 
we have a Fourier series where the coefficients are given by this. This is the fundamental frequency. It turns out this is another property of the um, of the uh, uh, Fourier transform that the frequency domain representation of P, where P has a Fourier series, is given by 2 pi times the summation from k going from minus infinity to infinity. It looks like we're going to need a little bit more room here. Of the Fourier series coefficient c sub k times delta of omega minus k omega 0. Okay, again that's the fundamental frequency. Uh, again what this is saying is that a periodic signal in the frequency domain has, um, uh, it, it looks like a, a series of impulses where each impulse is at uh, an integer multiple of the fundamental frequency. Now, in our case, c sub k is 1 over t sub s, so this becomes, uh, let's see, this becomes 2 pi over t sub s, the summation k going from minus infinity to infinity of delta of omega minus k. Omega 0, in this case, was 2 pi over t sub s. So, now we have the expression for p of omega. And unfortunately, I'm running out of time, so we'll, in the next video, uh, go to the frequency domain. Uh, we know that in the time domain, we're multiplying x and p, so in the frequency domain, that's going to be a convolution. We'll actually perform that convolution, and then uh, see what this implies for uh, our sampling theorem. So, we'll uh, start in the next video there.